the Australian coach, Stacey Marinkovic, desperately wanted six weeks. Uh, she just didn't win the battle. They got a whiff of it in the Commonwealth Games. If their midcourt can stay disciplined, boy, they are going to be hard to beat. You know, I don't know that, that anyone goes into this favourites. I think this will be by far be the toughest World Cup we've ever seen. Liz Watson, you know, for her to be able to supply these two quality shooters is going to be key and, and stopping that link will be what everyone has to target defensively. The thing with the Australian shooters, and we're not used to in New Zealand, is that fast movement in the shooting circle. Karen and Jane in particular, what they will add to the Silver Ferns is immense. And then, you know, add to that, we know what Amelia Ann brings anyhow. She polishes off any team to make them champions, and I think that is where the threat is. No mai ki te hōtaka o te neti poro kiwi. Welcome to the Kiwi Netball Show. I'm Bridget Honeycliffe. Just a few sleeps to go before the sport's biggest showpiece gets underway on African soil for the first time ever. Who will take out the sport's ultimate prize? Can the Silver Ferns win back-to-back World Cups for the first time in their history? Or will it be Australia, the reigning Commonwealth Games champs, who get the final piece of silverware back in the cabinet? Are Jamaica capable of winning their first pinnacle event? Can England bounce back from a disappointing 12 months or could South Africa even throw a spanner in the works? To help me answer some of these questions, I'm joined by former Silver Ferns coach Yvonne Willering, former England coach Tracy Neville and South Africa-bound Australian commentator Sue Gordian. Kia ora, welcome. First, I'm just going to go straight into looking at the schedule because we're about to start hosting in New Zealand and Australia the Women's Football World Cup. And I have had a look at the schedule and the football fans have got five days between each pool game. In a couple of months, the Rugby World Cup, the All Blacks will have at least a week between every game. Tracy, Netball World Cup, World Cup, eight games in 10 days. How brutal is that schedule? Um, yeah, but I think we have to think about the the grueling club season that a lot of these players have come off and the mental highs and lows that they've experienced. And then what they're having to do now is change focus. And then there's a huge pressure on them now from the international coaches to get them into holding camp um, as soon as possible. So the actual build into them eight to, um, to 10 games. And then I think, you know, when you look at the physical um the physical demand of the tournament that actually these games are are not interspersed. They actually get harder as the latter parts of the game. And I think it's those who can mentally stay in the competition and also the, you know, the the quality of the coaches to be able to rotate the players against certain oppositions. So without um, sacrificing any losses, but also, you know, trying to get them combos on court, you know, versus that recovery. So, I think, you know, when you when you see this um, with the World Cup, it's not like the Commonwealth Games. You don't play like a league system. Your games actually get more challenging as you start to go through, which is, is great for the spectator, but probably not for the players who, again, have probably been playing since last January. Yeah. Yvonne, you've had some involvement in um, the Silver Ferns' recent camps. Are they doing anything particularly different? Oh, that'd be telling. Yeah. <laughs> Just with regards to what, what Tracy said, it's interesting though. Um, yes, the games get progressively harder, but now you're talking about the top four teams. But you just imagine some of the lower ranked teams like the Tongans, Malawis, Fiji. They are going to have hard games right at the beginning, and then they're going to be playing games that they could realistically win. So mm. it's going to be really hard for them whether they want high scores against them or they whether they pin their best combination against some of these top teams. So different style of coaching with that, those lower ranked teams. So, yeah, that's going to be interesting in itself as well. Um, yeah, with regards to the Ferns, um, and I've had a little bit to do with them, um, appreciate the last World Championships. You had your Kaupua, your Langman, and your Tutaia. And whilst I call them experienced players, some people call them fossils. But now I think, obviously, they're not there anymore. So that experience is gone. So now it's really more as what I call a collective unit. Um, Defensively, they'll still want to do uh, a lot of space marking rather than that tight one-on-one defence that, for instance, Australia is used to because I know Australia, obviously, they play against it all the time. So the Ferns will want to come out with something different there. So certainly we hope to see some different defensive setups whereby we're creating intercepts, not just a zone, but some different dif- um, uh, different yeah, intercepting formations. And I'm certainly looking forward to seeing those. Mm. So you're heading to South Africa to commentate. This is a big moment for African netball. Yeah, a huge moment, a huge moment for my uh, suitcase as well. I'm trying to find everything colourful I possibly can 
to take over there. I've got a feeling it'll be a, a, a loud and colourful and um, very involved World Cup, which I think is terrific. But um, yeah, enormous for them. If you you know if you watch the social media that's currently unfolding and even the, the World Cup, the trophy tour at the moment, a real engagement from, you know, the, the bigger towns and even some of the smaller towns as well. And I think uh, it's an opportunity, Bridget, for South Africa to showcase their elite women's sport at, at a completely different level. And we all know what, what a good World Cup can do financially for, um, you know, for your sport. And, and I think for South Africa, this is this is enormous, not just for South Africa, but all the African nations that will be there and countries that will be there playing. So um, it's a big one and it's one they'll want to get right. Right, let's look at the contenders, starting with Jamaica. Finished with silver at last year's Commonwealth Games, their best ever result. I recently spoke to Rob Wright, the specialist defensive coach with the Sunshine Girls, and asked him about Jamaica's chances. Let's have a listen. We've got a, a good side, but there's plenty of good sides. Like Clearly Australia, to me, is favourite. New Zealand's very clever. They've got a six-week lead in, into Worlds with Dame Nolene, so they're going to have a lot of time together. I, I think they're second favourites, really. Um, so I think we're in that next um, echelon. Um, but, yeah, we've just got to continue working that consistency. I thought we learned some really good stuff out of Com Games. I thought, personally, it was my first Com Games. I thought, personally, I probably overworked our defenders a bit, which probably in the final... It didn't help us as much as it would, so that's a good learning for me. Um, but, yeah, so there's certainly some other things that we learned from that and hopefully we can, um, yeah, push because, you know, we want to we want to be in the finals. That's the first thing you've got to do, but we're also in a pool with South Africa. So with Norma Plummer back, like, so all of a sudden I think they're going to be an incredibly different side to what we saw at Com Games. So the first bit, we've got to get out of the pool. But, you know, we have a team that on their day can beat any team. But uh, in saying that, I think so can Australia, so can New Zealand, so can England and probably so can South Africa. So um, I, I take nothing for granted. We have to work incredibly hard to get to the four uh, and then we'll see where we're at from there. Do you think Australia are playing a bit of a dangerous game just with the scheduling of the SCCM and they're not going to have a lot of time together as the Diamonds team before the World Cup? I think it's incredibly dangerous strategy. I... Luckily, they're one in the world, and they're probably they might be able to afford to do that. I to only finish 20 days before Worlds. Well, wow, um, they're obviously super confident in their ability to um, to go with that. Dame Nolene's six-week lead-in is I, I would be wanting that all, every day of the week. And if, if Australia did that, they're going to be even more scary. Like they're number one in the world for a reason. Their favourites going into this. They're an incredibly strong side, but. Wow, either they're underestimating New Zealand or um, I'm not quite sure. So I think, wow, I wouldn't be doing it. So do you think Australia are taking a risk with having a reasonably short lead in time or is playing in the SCCN part of the build-up anyway because they are coming up against some of the best Jamaican and England players anyway? Uh, do you know, what? firstly, good on you, Rob. Well done. <laughs> uh, fighting words. Love it. Um, look, to be honest with you, uh, I was part of the decision making around uh, the dates for Suncorp Super Netball, and I can categorically tell everyone listening to this that the Australian coach Stacey Marinkovic desperately wanted six weeks. Uh, she just didn't win the battle. That's that's the point. So this isn't a decision that the Australian Diamonds made to say, "Gee, we're we're so good, we don't need and we don't need the lead in time." It had nothing to do with that. It's a very uh, multi complex decision making process. Um, and where the weight sits in that decision-making can at times be uh, difficult to understand. So Suncorp Super Netball, um, uh, you know, ultimately landed where it did and the cards were dealt from Marinkovic and she'll do what she needs to do with those cards accordingly to, to the World Cup. So absolutely no arrogance on behalf of, of the Diamonds in this case. Yeah, I think could, just adding to that, yeah, Sue, could go for um, it. The, t the 2018 Commonwealth Games, we had a huge building um, because the Sun Cup didn't actually start till after that particular competition in Brisbane. Um, and you saw that we obviously come out in gold. It, it was actual gold for me as a coach to actually spend the time with my players leading into that particular competition. Um, we weren't fortunate to have that the World Cup because you're obviously dependent on leagues starting and um, commercial contracts across the world. Um, 
But yeah, it is absolutely valuable time. So, you know, the New Zealand team have actually got the Silver Ferns. I've got one step ahead on that because the time to spend with your players, you can, you know, you can nail in your culture, your focus, your identity, what you're going to do against each opposition team. Um, and it, and that is absolutely crucial and viable going into a huge competition. Yeah. With the Ferns, and you said they had that six-week uh, period, and they've just finished now and, and uh, they leave Thursday, Friday, and, uh, and you look at them now and, you know, they've done the necessary preparation. Dame Nolan Terry has ticked all the boxes, and you can see it on the players. They are ready to go. They are ready to go to that next chapter, which obviously is the World Championship. So certainly they don't feel rushed. They feel that they certainly are as a collective unit, and uh, that's how they're going to go. With Australia, I guess you had a situation, Steph Wood and Conan, at least that is a combination that's together. Um, but, uh, you know, an Australian team, once they hit that court, man, they are competitive as. But I know Rob Wright said, you know, Jamaica's probably third. I'm not sure. I think they got a whiff of it in the Commonwealth Games. They sold themselves short in the final. They will say that, you know, and I think they've now, some of their key players, what they've got six players, I think, in the Australian um, league, you know, and that has been just so much value to them. And certainly I tremendously rate their defensive circle and also their shooting circle. So if their, their midcourt can stay disciplined, boy, they are going to be hard to beat. Yeah, I mean, so there's there's no reason why Jamaica couldn't go all the way in Cape Town, right? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've only just got off the phone from Jim Neil Fowler, who's over there at the moment, and they're talking a big game. So, um, and and isn't that half of it to actually go away and believe you're capable? And I think that that is that has been probably one of the most significant differences that that. Suncorp Super Netball has brought not just to the Jamaicans, but go, you know, Trace, you could probably vouch for this as well, that, you know, players come out and start playing against international opposition on a weekly basis and some of that mystery goes and confidence comes in. So I absolutely believe that Jamaica are capable. Um, but, you know, I don't know that that anyone goes into this favourites. I think this will be by far be the toughest World Cup we've ever seen. We're coming off a World Cup that had the closest of finals, semifinals with only two goals, the difference in both semifinals four years ago. And I think that, uh, that, that teams are growing closer and closer um, every day. And, and and you're right, Rob is right when he says the team that steps up on the day, right, you know, you've got to be able to turn up, you've got to be able to perform, and every country is capable of doing that in that top five, but every country is also capable of not performing on the day, Australia included. So um, Jamaica should give themselves a red-hot chance and belief is part of that. Yeah, agree. Yeah, I agree. The sides, I think, it is shaping up to the to be the tightest World Cup we've ever seen. Tracy, I can't help thinking it. When is Jamaica ever going to have a better chance at this World Cup? Do you know, I've I've seen a light switch on with um, Shamira Sterling and Latanya Wilson this year. Um, you know, coming out of Commonwealth Games last year, they, you know, they didn't they weren't happy to be they weren't happy to get that silver medal. And that is a massive switch in in thinking. You know, they weren't happy to be in that final and they were happy to take that silver medal. They were absolutely devastated that they actually lost the chance to beat Australia again in that particular competition. And I think that's really paid them stead this year. And we also have to have the added advantage that a lot of their back end um, is being coached by Australian coaches who are at the top of the game. You know, so each week they are being you know, specialised. If I think about the defence in our particular franchises, you know, they twice, twice, three times a week, they're getting specialist defensive coaching on playing against international shooters. So against, you know, against Swifts, it was like your Helen Halsby against, um, when we played Lightning, it was against, um, you know, Steph Wood and Cara Conan. So they're actually learning how to play on these players as well. And that in itself um, and I'm sure Sue's doing the same at West Coast Fever with um, Janelle Fowler. But, you know, th- there is talk around, is that enough to have two, hen- two ends as world class as they've got? And it's just now about how they can feed the ball because we have to think about the ball gets to Janelle Fowler because she has world class players in front of her being able to give a ball supply. And likewise, you know, when people like um, Shamira, Latanya, Jodie, Katie Ann, they have... 
they have top class players taking the ball away from them down to the shooting end to be, enable them to you know win games. So I think that's where the talking points around Jamaica have been around whether their mid court around that centre wing attack wing defence uh, sorry goal attack can actually step up. Um, Yvonne, Rob talked about, you know, being in the same pool with South Africa and, you know, he highlighted Norma Plummer's back, Carla Pretorius is back. Uh-huh. The the Silver Ferns in Jamaica on that same side of the pool, how weary do you think they will be of South Africa? And, and you have to be. But, boy, South Africa is under a lot of pressure uh, because at the moment, like, the, the trophy's being sort of taken around the countryside. I, I heard that on the news, you know, and they're basically uh, saying, you know, this is the trophy that we're going to win. Norma's not saying that. The team's not saying that. It's just some of the some of the management group, the, the outer group with that. But certainly, yeah, I wouldn't uh, – you've seen them in the past when they've been at full strength. Don't forget they've got Potgator as well. Um, Masomi's in there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you, you cannot underestimate them. And, and exactly like Rob Wright said, you know, if you take a team lightly and you're going to be in trouble. And, uh, yeah, Norma will want us talking favourably about South Africa and having them in the mix. But internationally, isn't it great for world netball that we're not just focusing on Australia and New Zealand and, you know, all these other teams are there. And England, too, will be hurting um, from the Commonwealth Games. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly, boy, their shooting end is, is is wonderful when you look at it with Halsby and Carnwell in there. And so, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting competition. And South Africa has just got to absorb the pressure. They have to absorb the pressure and take the crowd into account. I know that they're a very loud crowd, but they need to see that as a positive and not a negative. Okay, let's have a look at Australia's lineup. The change from the Commonwealth Games. Jamie Lee Price is in for Kate Maloney. Sophie Garbin is in. Obviously, no Gretel Buita, who's pregnant. Um, so happy with the team that was selected. I just look at Australia and think, man, they're going to be re- relentless and ruthless on attack as always. Yeah, look, I, look, I was happy. I think you could have chosen a couple of teams to be blatantly honest with you. I think that the, the way the depth of talent is in the country at the moment, but I think I think the decision made around the twelve they're taking stem very heavily from their performance in the quad series early in the year and noting the limited time that they would have together um, leading into this World Cup, as we've just previously discussed. So, look, you know, Garvin's probably been the most controversial talking point, fairly average season of Suncorp Super Netball, um, probably playing a fair portion of that out of her comfort position of goal shooter. But what does she look like inside a Diamonds environment where, you know, she's got quality around her, um, a very good relationship and and confidence with the coach um, and likely to spend a portion of time back in in her comfort zone at goal shooter? And I think that's the decision that was made behind Garvin. And and I'm comfortable with that and support that. Um, I was really happy with Jamie Lee Price going in. For me, uh, she's a point of difference in every way you can possibly think about. She can, you know, she's she's multi-positional, which I think is critical at this point in time in the game of netball around the world. Um, you know, I think she can impact a game from off the bench and she can also start the game and have some real presence. The biggest key for me and always is with Jamie Lee Price is just her ability to stay away from the whistle. And obviously we know when we head to World Cup and we get that variety of umpiring style that it can impact a performance. And so hopefully she's going to be smart enough as are the coaches around her to ensure that she plays her best netball without a whistle involved. Tracy, Steph Wood and Kara Conan, their shooter-to-shooter play is so tough to defend and they've really got it down to an art. Those two can make life hell for circle defenders, right? Oh, um, when you you think about some post lightning um, this year, the volume of shots that they actually generated um, for their team was huge. And, And let's not underestimate that um, they were generating that from a ball supply from, you know, up and coming, inexperienced centre court. Um, with with having Liz Watson, Paige Hadley, Jamie Lee Price there being able to get that ball supply to them. Um, you know, talk, let's talk about Liz Watson. You know, she's the highest feeder in the league, most successful feeder in the league. She's the one that everyone wants the ball in hands or we have to stop the ball in hands. So for her to be able to supply these two quality shooters is going to be key and, and stopping that link will be what everyone has to target defensively. Um, But then, you know, you look at Sophie Garvin as well, you know, when 
she's been in, she she was exceptional against New Zealand. And when you're picking your team, I think people look at what they, you know, what they bring, you know. So when you're looking at this from a coaching point of view, it's, you know, it's matching styles now. It's sometimes not about you starting seven. It's about which style plays against um, the countries that you're going to have to beat to, you know, to get that gold medal. And Sophie Garbin absolutely nailed her performance against New Zealand, who, in my mind, Australia will be thinking they're going to have to compete at some point in this competition and we'll need someone like her to be able to do that. And I do think, actually, Sue, just going on your point, I actually think Sophie Garbin started to gain a lot more confidence towards the end of the season um, and actually started to play a really key role in that goal attack. So although she probably had what they'd call an ordinary season, I actually thought she developed quite well towards the end and got a few wins, you know, for her club as well. And I reckon that was right about the time she might have got the phone call to say things were looking good. (laughs) (laughs) I'd probably annoyed me and you at some point. Yeah, Yvonne, um, already been mentioned the names Liz Watson and Steph Wood. They really are a two-pronged threat. How much will opposition be co- coaches be thinking about? Because you're not necessarily even going to contain them. You're just going to try and limit the damage of a Liz Watson. Yeah, and it's a fine line how much focus you put on the opposition and how much you focus on your own team play. But certainly, um, Noel's, uh, Dame Nolan Toro, she knows these players really well. Don't forget from the Lightning days. But I think the days of a main lineup, a top seven, are gone. And I think that certainly coaches are now looking at whatever combination, whether it's to combat the opposition or what will, you know, win it against the, the opposition. They're going more and more for that. But the thing with the Australian shooters and something that's that it's not as we're not used to in New Zealand is that fast movement in in the shooting circle. We tend to always have have a holding shooter and a moving shooter, and again, that's what we've got uh, within the team. So whilst you know Australia's in a situation they haven't had a lot of um, match play against um, you know where we're marking space rather than one on one defence. Mm. Similarly, the you know New Zealand hasn't had the same preparation, I suppose, against moving shooters. Although uh, certainly we've played against the, the team has played against the men, some men's combination. And I'm telling you, Dame Nolan Taru, she's she's had tall shooters in there. She's had short ones. She's had moving ones. She's had a rotating defence end. So yeah, it's a situation you can only do so much preparation, and then at the end of the day, it's up to the players. And like you indicated before, Australia as a team hasn't had that same preparation as some of these other teams have. And neither has Jamaica for that matter, because don't forget they were also involved in the Suncorp uh, final. Right, let's move on to the England Roses. Disappointing twelve last 12 months, fourth at last year's Commonwealth Games, or how to a draw at the Quad Series in January by South Africa. Joe Harton since retired from internationals. Um, on the plus side, though, you've got Al Cardwell and Helen Housby in amazing form, both played in the ECCN final. Um, Tracy, I don't think we've seen them come even close to their best as a combination. And, you know, imagine how good they, lethal they could be if they really get it together. Yeah, I think Ella Cardwell has um, in particular um, grown so much over the season. It's been an absolute pleasure to see some of the qualities that the Suncourt Super Netball has really brought out in her and Adelaide Thunderbirds. Um, As a combination, I don't think they've nailed it, but I have seen them nail it in the past. They obviously come from Manchester Thunder and you know, have been in a final position where they've actually played together. And I think it's, it's just for me about nailing what identity or style that you want them to play because I think by you know playing Helen back and Ellie out or Ellie in and Helen out I think there has to be clear tactics and roles around that particular um game style because you know having coached both of them shooters um they they operate in a completely different way um and you know Ellie isn't a holding direct shooter although she can play that game I think you have to bring out the best in the movement and the hold with Ellie. And it's just how you complement that with Helen's real possession on the ball. I think the talking point for me um, around this is there's huge talk about her only taking three specialist shooters and all three specialist shooters offer the same style in, in a, in a sort of way. They don't, there's just nothing different. So there was talk about missing out on Sophie Drakeford Lewis, but I'm a big advocate of Natalie Metcalf, and I know she has established herself as that starting wing attack position. Um, but she has had been, you know, thrown in at key points during the, you know, the Super League season at that goal attack. And 
I actually think it brings out, that goal attack game brings out the best in her wing attack game as well, and particularly with the inclusion of Chelsea Pittman. I think for me with Natalie Metcalf is, and the question around it is she's never been tried and tested internationally for a long time. And I think that's where, you know, is it in the earlier rounds she actually gets played in that goal attack position, which then you could sacrifice some of her unit and combination work in that wing attack position. So, And it's also, there was talk about the recovery, how do the rest Nat- Natalie Metcalf, they're building the whole attack end around her. So I think there has been questions around that particular scenario. Yvonne, what do you make of the England side with the three the three shooters, five mid-quarters split? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I think same with the Ferns. You have a look at it. Um, we're very heavy in the midcourt as well. And in a way, you can look at it and say, listen, the midcourt is what holds the whole thing together. And we mentioned that with Jamaica. Without that midcourt humming along, you know, they're not going to be exactly the same team. Only thing I question about England is I actually question their defensive unit, exactly who is going to take it in circle. Is it going to be Jeeva Mento and Guskov? They, I guess, have a wonderful combination, but they've been together for a long time. So opposition also are pretty well uh, well aware of exactly where they sit. So Tracy, I don't know if um, you see any other combination that's likely to take the court for them. Well, I, you can only look at from a shot window. Um, you know, if you look at January, Jeeva was very rarely included in any of the, the sort of long-term plan of um, Jess Thurby and obviously um, retiring from international. So you know, I think she started to try and work on other combinations. Fran Williams has had an excellent Super League season. And with the combination of Fumi for Doju at the back, is that something she's doing? Because actually that that complements some of that rotational stuff we've been talking about. Um, I think Layla hasn't had the best international um, season. However, I do think there's an there's a role and place for her within that and her established combination with Jeeva Mentor. And you talk about experience in that, them two do offer that experience position. I think the question around it would be that goalkeeper positioning because we are pretty heavy around that goal defence. And, and, you know, with not having given Jeeva that international experience back in January, although Jeeva's had, I would say, probably one of her best Suncorp Super Netball um, seasons, um, you know, they've not been able to establish new relationships forming and are they able to do that quickly? Because they, again, in that short time period, have been able to work together going into that World Cup. Yeah. So I wonder if the England mid-court is going to be as quick as New Zealand's and, in New Zealand's and Australia's. And, you know, who who is England's starting centre? I feel like they're, they're still missing Serena Guthrie. Oh, well, yeah, obviously. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely, they're missing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> we all we all miss the greats of the past, don't we? So, um, yeah. Look, I, look. This is an interesting one, you know, because it's one thing to say, will they be able to keep up with the speed? Speed doesn't necessarily win your netball because you've still got to be able to execute the skill and finish the job, right? So, um, England can might not have, and I don't think they have comparable speed to both Australia and to New Zealand. Um, but I do think, though, that they've got some experience in there. My concern still stems back to the Jade Clark decision, um, and I, I want to I want to refrain from casting forward judgment on how she's going to play at this World Cup. I hope she contributes really well, um, but I'm concerned off the back of the last couple of games that I saw her play internationally back in January that. She wasn't at the standard that we had previously seen. Uh, and if anything, at times I felt possibly holding back the midcourt slightly because of the style and the way that she plays. That said, though, there is room for that, but I don't know if it's 60 minutes of netball. But we're now staring down the barrel of most sides looking and saying, well, we don't we don't have starting sevens, as Yvonne mentioned before. So um, I, I'm a little – I find it hard to get my head – quite straight around the England midcourt at the moment. I think the best thing I can say is there's great opportunity for someone to stand up and put their hand up and let's see what happens. I sort of agree with Sue on that, um, that we've not have had that established centre for since Serena Guffrey retired. Um, I think Laura Malcolm put herself in the best position and Yvonne could probably talk a lot more about her and, what what she did out in New Zealand, you know, she put her hand up, made the move to New Zealand to place a consistent centre all season. And Jay Clark did that with Pulse Netball as well. 
Imogen Allison played a lot internationally in that centre role, but played, you know, for Bath in that wing defence. So, you know, where we've been seeing players play internationally, they've probably been sacrificed with some of their club decisions. But I feel that the players have put them probably self in the best mark. It's just, again, as Sue said, who can actually hold the hand up and take that starting seven position. And you do want a consistent centre in there because they become the orchestra orchestrator of the actual team and it's really important that they have a complete you know a role within that okay let's talk about the silver ferns the defending champs with oh, Matt- I was when we- oh best to last <laughs> Yvonne best to last um <laughs> so with Amelia yes. and Ikanasio Karen Berger and Jane Watson back yes. so um the other countries must be expecting the silver ferns will be a far stronger side to what we saw in Birmingham Yes, yes, and yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> big, big fan, big fan of all three. But look, you know, and I'm, I, I think, you know, we spoke last time on this podcast, and I said I had concerns um, uh, at the beginning of the year around the ability for the Silver Ferns to gain ball. Uh, P.S. They did a very good job of it. And they, I ate my words very quickly, but but I did feel like they were they were lacking sort of those real ball hunters like like Curran and, and and Jane, but, you know, what they bring back, the glimpses we're now seeing, the seasons they've had uh, domestically, uh, I think, yeah, I think absolutely. And and they bring experience. Like, that. that's half the battle, right? So that's why I don't want to cast judgment on Jay Clark. Experience speaks for a lot. Yeah. Um, but I do think for, for Curran and Jane in particular, what they will add to the Silver Ferns is immense. And then, you know, add to that, we know what Amelia Ann brings anyhow. To me, she's she's the absolute leader they need, but she'll be ably supported by the two that also join her back. It, mm. They'll be they'll be much better guys. Yeah. I know it. Yep, Yvonne, I want to see our Silver Ferns defenders go back to the days where they put the fear up opposition shooters. Do you think they can do that? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, it is, is that you, Yvonne? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, the, the space marking and the high zones, the, they're very much part of our game and the fact that we want to create intercepts and not get caught running around after players. And both Karen Berger and Jane Watson, and you obviously you already mentioned them, you know, they're hunters of the ball. I mean, surely as a as a, as an in-circle defender in particular, I mean, it isn't, it isn't your job really to get the ball, to get gain intercepts and obviously to have limited penalties against you. And I think this side is a far more experienced side than the Com games. Certainly those the inclusion of both Car and Jane and also Amelia and Ecanasio, they do provide, and I said that earlier on, that leadership, you know, that you need that, well, I was going to say a bit of mongrel, but I'm talking in the most positive way that way, uh, you know, that it's like they lead by example and they expect everyone else to join them in that journey. And uh, I think they're certainly a very together team. Grace Nowicki, uh, don't underestimate her. She's obviously far more experienced. I think she only had four or five test caps under a belt when she was at the Commonwealth Games mm-hmm. and she certainly has developed as a as a shooter. Now, she's still a close range shooter, but boy, she's got tremendous elevation. So she's going to provide a headache for lots of different teams. Um, and certainly, yes, we do have, uh, the Ferns have a very fast mid-court combination. Some uh, obviously the Cramptons of the world, very experienced. You've got Kate Heffernan, who's quite a defensive centre and quite tall and a couple of newbies. You've got Suna and Gordon, and whilst, and as Sue alluded to it, whilst it's a very fast midcourt, it's also a situation where there are times when actually you've got to slow the pace of the game down. Like if you're playing against Australia, you do not want to play at exactly the same pace as they're playing because the game actually could go totally out of control. So that's the time when you slow it down and, uh, you know, and just you execute your passes uh, perfectly. So, yeah, Silver Ferns, you can say, you know, defending champions, but that's not the way they will be looking at it. Different team, but they know, obviously, they're going for gold as – all the teams we've mentioned, that is the aim of all the teams. And I just think that's going to be brilliant and brilliant for the competition. Tracy, I think probably Nolene's greatest, one of her greatest strengths is getting a team peaking, you know, when it really counts. And she's also got that World Cup experience that Jess Elby and Stacey Marinkovic don't have. Um, you know, could she be the difference here? She she's always the difference to any team. You, you've seen the success and the history of her coaching career. Um, 
she 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 polishes off any team to make them champions. And I think that is where the threat is. I think the threat with this team is that what she's done is she knew when she went into the Commonwealth Games last year, it you know, her team probably weren't a championship goal winning team. But what she did is she established players in in positions, she gave people experience, she took out the win when she needed it under huge pressure. If you look at when they lost to England in their preliminary rounds. Um, but for me, it's the scary part of who's going to start in this team because you know, each one of them is very, very valuable um, and can play against uh, great matchups against all the other former teams that we've just been talking about. And and I think she's very, very good at moving chess pieces and playing the right players and the the right team at the right time and and bringing in the good the players that can do actually a role for her. And I think that's where her added strength as a coaching um, head coach is is exceptional. Right, before I get you to name four players to watch at the Commonwealth Games, we'll just have a little segue. A little clip I found in the archives, going back quite some way, I wonder if one of you can guess who is speaking in the following clip. Sue, you might get this, so that's the first clue. Let's take a listen. I think that is netball at world championship level. We've seen it before, and... um you know, I think until the international body comes to grips with some of it, the issues involved in administering the sport, then this is a, a daily, it's going to be a daily occurrence. Yeah, I mean, that's par for the course now. We know it. I mean, we told the players that they were well prepared for it. So we don't offer excuses. Bit of a, scra- no. bit of a scratchy recording there. I- anyone got any idea who that might have been? 1987. I'm so bad at reality game shows. <laughs> <laughs> no, nine, okay, World Champs 1987, Glasgow. It wasn't an umpire, was it? Coach. Yeah, Australian netball coach. Wilma Shakespeare. Wilma? Yeah. Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, now, hold on. Oh. Let, me, let me share this with you. I did have Wilma as a coach, and her voice was a lot more frightening than that lady just speaking. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was a scratchy recording. So, yeah, that was Wilma Shakespeare talking about the roughhouse tactics employed by Trinidad and Tobago oh. after they finished in a draw at the 1987 World Champs. Shakespeare went on to say, until the administrator has decided to do something about roughhouse tactics, we'll continue at world level. 36 years on, it's not an issue that's ever really gone away. I've brought this up because just before the World Cup, Congress will vote on rule changes with an emphasis on cracking down on dangerous play and persistent infringing. Yvonne, any concerns about what's being proposed? There'll be no rule changes come into play until next year. But the main one, the concussion and the dangerous play, yes, there's going to be a lot of discussion a- a- about that. But the one thing which I do like that that's on the cards is that if a player does get sent off, I mean, that's a major, you know, And but after four minutes, another player can take the court. So even if you've been sent off, it doesn't mean for the, for the rest of the game. Because you imagine if you were sent off in the first three minutes of the game and you're playing with six players for the rest of the game, that just destroys the game both for the team and also for the spectators so at least you know they've discussed this and this is what they want to propose but appreciate it's still got to be voted on still holding our breath really just to see what changes are going to be made and what interpretations are going to be made yeah so i get the feeling that they're anticipating there may be more suspensions and even ordering offs as a result of these changes and so bringing in that four minutes you can send another player on. Is kind of them anticipating that that might happen? Possibly, possibly. I look. I also, you know, for me, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of. If you've got to send someone off, send them off, but don't embarrass our game. You know, like I, playing playing in a in an international game and having seven v six on a court. Just, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of it. Anyhow, so I'm glad to see that happen. Four minutes. Don't know. It's probably a bit too long for me. I reckon about two or three. Um, <laughs> My concern is is that some of these rule changes are happening because one aspect of our game is growing at a rate well beyond the others. And Mm -hmm. so, therefore, you know, we're seeing a game become faster, more physical, um, and is a rule change 
the answer to that or are there other ways that we do it? And I think it's a bit of everything. Rule changes are important. Some of them are probably going to protect the game, getting a little bit too aggressive and physical as we move forward and protect given all the concussion stuff that we're starting to see happen in the world of sport. But we also need an investment to ensure that we are bringing our coaches and our umpires on a similar journey worldwide. I think that's critical. But the game has certainly evolved and changed over the last four years, no two ways about it. Yeah, Yeah. Tracy, any concerns about what's being proposed in the rule changes? Um, I'm on the same board as Sue. I think four minutes for you to go down to six aside is is lethal at international netball, particularly with the you know the number of goals that are scored per minute. I think there could be so much more benefit about spending more time with umpires and <clears throat> and officials to develop the game further. And and Sue's right, you know, the umpires get the short end of the stick. They get the least amount of support and investment. And, you know, that that actually has, has caused quite a few problems this year because we need to keep them up on the game. We also need to give them more support. So I think talking around, do we need a third umpire at particular points? And I think the Suncorp at some point brought that in to to assist the umpires in, in their decision-making around the two-point shot. So, you know, I think I think the game is evolving and I think that is one area that we can start evolving as well. Mm. Okay, just the final segment. Um, I asked you to think about four key players that you will be looking out for in particular um, at the World Cup. Um, Yvonne, who are your four? Yeah, this actually was a hard one. So I thought about it from New Zealand because all these players that I'm about to name are integral into their performance, I believe. And for New Zealand, Grace Nowicki, even though she's just a youngster, um, she has far more experience now. She has height and elevation. I indicated that earlier. Now, if she can just, um, well, not say disciplined, but, I mean, she has got a little bit more experience out on court now. And once she gets ball in hand, and certainly she is relatively easy to feed, and once she gets ball in hand, even though it's a close shot, she is very accurate or she will get her rebound. And so I think she's going to be a very important part to the New Zealand team, along, obviously, as um, Ignacio. Jamaica, I have to go with both ends uh, because I think they're, they're key. Fowler at one end and Sterling at the uh, at the other end. I rate both these players, particularly Sterling. I just love the way she comes out for intercepts and hopes that continues. And for Australia, geez, I am staying with defenders here. Courtney Bruce, um, I actually really rate her. The only thing that is against her, I believe, is a high penalty count. Uh, and sometimes she tends to go for the player and not for the ball. But when she goes out looking for a ball in flight, oh, she's a menace. And, uh, you know, if she can get ball to their shooters, the Australians are not going to miss. So those probably are my four key players. So who have you gone with? Oh, this is just the hardest question, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but let's go with the four that I sort of think are interesting. I'm going to South Africa, Elmerai Vandenberg. So uh, most people probably... I've only started to get a glimpse of her. Um, she's a youngster coming through that Norma Plummer has put the biggest spotlight on to say that she is going to be a star of the future. She's a mix of Irene Van Dyke and Sherelle McMahon. Holy heck. Um, so look out for her. <laughs> wow. Um, Kate Heppinen, for me, uh, I said this last time and I say it again, just yep. love, love the size of her in the midcourt. Uh, she's growing, as we said, you know, only only four caps the last time she played, or only, no, zero caps, I think, mm-hmm. leading into that last series. So, so keen to to see what she does through the middle. Um, always a fan of a team that has a tall mid-quarter in it. Just think it's a point of difference. Uh, Fumi, for me, for Doju from England, I'm really interested to see what she does on a world stage. Um, and, you know, we, we saw some glimpses of her coming through. Everyone knows how exciting she is. Again, the dynamics of what England are going to do defensively with the stalwarts of Gusketh and Mentor, but just excited to see her light up the the court. And the other one for me is with Jamaica, Jodie Ann Ward. She's just had the most phenomenal domestic season. You go and add her to the mix of Latanya Wilson and Shamira Sterling, and I just I just can't wait to see what she can do in amongst that support around her. So they're the four for me. Tracy, who have you gone with? Well, Sue's killed me on two of mine because I've gone, um, I've gone Kate Heffernan. I, I really think you know they talk about her being the next Laura Langman, and um, 
really impressed with the way she's um, adapted to the international style. And I do, I have been watching a bit of her at club as well, um, you know, taking in some of that New Zealand style as well. And I think she's really committed to the Silver Ferns and she's fresh. Um, you know, she, you know, she's just here to have a crack, and I think she does genuinely have a crack at it. And I'm, I'm excited to see whether, you know, she's had the experience of last year um, and some of that international competition in January, and whether she can actually bring it to the forefront where she actually becomes an established starting seven player for that Silver Ferns. Um, Fumi Bidoju, I agree with Sue. Is she going to be a found out player? Um, she come onto the international scene. Um, very spunky, very in your face, you know, taking great intercepts. People didn't know what to expect from her, where she's going to be going. And, you know, teams are going to do work on her. And, you know, as she now got the next step in her international game to be able to take that further, to be able to start adjusting and adapting so she can still bring out that flair that we we know that she's so excellent at doing. The one I've gone for in the Jamaican side is... Um, Jodie's counterpart is Latanya Wilson. Um, I think this this year she's really established herself across that line. Um, and with Jodie and Ward, you know, what are they going to bring by flipping them? Because they play so differently, um, but they're so talented in their own right. And they've done jobs this year on some of the top class players in, in the Sun Corp. So I'm excited to see where she is played and where she particularly excels. And the last one for me is um, Jamie Lee Price. Um, Australia, from when I've known them, have always had an established centre. Um, Kate Maloney brought in that sort of calmness, sweep, you know, sweeping up people's mess, that running miles up and down. Jamie Lee, I think, offers something different for an Australian centre. She she can run miles up and down, but she also has a huge defensive game. And she she's so much bully on court getting into that attack as well and and her feed into circle. She's not scared. Um, and I just want to see how she flourishes um at this World Cup and whether she again can be the next Australian centre for the next four to five years. <laughs>